je ne sais pas, tu sais, une place où aller prendre. Je ne sais pas d'être honnête dans un centre d'achat. Non, mais là, j'exagère même pas, mais je souvent en télé au Québec. Il n'y a tellement pas de budget. Frogs! Il faut changer de location. Il faut changer de Frogs! French have taken over American radios. This is the end. Beautiful friend. Uh, Quebec. What do you think of the Québécois? Québécois? Croix? Oui? We do not have any wine. We only have the beer. American beer. Because we are not frogs. Isn't that right, dog? Freedom fries. Freedom fries. Want me listening so close. From far away, memorized what you told me like a foreigner on holiday. I smile at confusion, get the soul. Smiles on me, sing on the highway, I can line that led from you to me, I'll be at my station all night, come on by. If you feel like still here. What am I doing? I, it's not my early 20s. I have class now. Or so I like to imagine. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whatever time it is, wherever it finds you. Welcome to Tap Daddy Podcast. It's not actually on tap because I'm not that rich yet. But hopefully I will be. Drop a couple of bucks in that Patreon, if you feel so inclined. I run the Fractal Journal, which you can find at https colon slash slash fractaljournal.com, link below, where I write in a variety of topics in a bloggish format. There's also some books I'm working on, which honestly, um, I'm taking way too long on, but I am making the effort as diligently as I can. This episode is about random odds and ends, and I'm going to try to make it more of a podcast length, since they call it the Oddity Podcast, even though it's actually just a YouTube channel. I did play about with trying to get it onto like a Zencast or something like that, but resources were too tight to commit to that at the moment. Anyhow, it is what it is, and I hope you enjoy. Uh, there's a lot of different things that just go through my mind. For instance, if you're familiar with the blog or website, what have you, the fractaljournal.com, you know that I like to take a topic and just kind of frame it in a kind of like a mood but then, then try to bring some kind of philosophical or logical insight through it. And it is what it is. And also, I like to tell stories because I read a lot of stories and I feel like they influenced my brain in a way that made it conducive to telling stories. So this is basically what this is. Me um, sharing ideas, maybe getting some feedback, whatever. Pretty cool stuff, right? I mean, if you're into it, I'm into it. So one of the things I'm most excited about is the accessibility of instruments. For instance, when I was a kid, my friend's mom was a violinist at a uh, symphony a few cities over. And uh, I also read a lot of Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes obviously famously plays violin. So I always thought, hey, dude, I want to learn to play violin. One day, about three years ago, around about 2013, this even like, says it's been made in 2013. So it's pretty cool. I have kind of like a timepiece or a... Um, Whatever you'd call it. <laughs> uh, memento. Um, yeah. I was in a music shop. There's a lot of these around. They're called Musician Supply. Um, and I, they were renting out things. But actually, it's actually more convoluted and interesting than that. Um, not convoluted, but a bit more complex. So my buddy, uh, who is a better musician innately than I am, 
was learning to play the piano. So he had this keyboard and he bought a slightly better keyboard and he gave me the first Casio, which was just this horrific thing for me to fiddle around on. But he wanted to play a real grand piano because he was at a point where he had kind of like sucked all the stuff that he could learn out of the keyboard that he had. So he'd go to a local church uh, to practice grand piano. And out there, there was a little basket with these brochures and it's like, uh, rent to own a violin. And so there's a musicandarts.com where you can, I think it was like $25, $30 or so a month. Eventually I ended up owning one of these. And <laughs> there's actually a concept I, I made up called, well, not I made up, but that came to me because I made it up. All right, violin yoga. Maybe there's some other hipster that has already said this, but yeah. Mm. Basically, the idea is because it's an instrument that engages uh, a lot of range of motion, you can use it as a meditative practice rather than doing your yoga. It's really simple, really dumb idea, but it works. As Sherlock Holmes said, I think in the Red-Headed League, I like to introspect. respect. Um, you know, I don't really know terribly much in terms of what I can play, but I do know the D, D scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. like a lot of songs like canon except that would be like much slower tempo for those notes yeah but it's really really fun and there's of course your uh, jigs I don't remember and so that kind of just like repertoire that you build but there's also a lot of cool rhythmic books which if you're a musician for like say guitar or you also play guitar whatever it is that I can describe myself as doing I don't know if I can really call myself a musician but if you play guitar I think that poly instrumentation uh, helps you get different ideas for different textures and uh, it just ingrains things in your brain and muscle memory more musically. So there's a, a some book somewhere here that I have that goes Do me do Do me so me do Do re mi fa so latino and stuff like that. And uh, there was a fiddle player that I took like one or two lessons from all I could afford. Uh, who said it was really good for developing rhythm, like the entire book was geared toward that. And I've often had a challenge with rhythm because I'm, I just think of things in kind of like a textural way. I've actually used to just hate drums. I didn't like music with drums in it. Uh, I liked really um, elaborate guitar pieces like Nick Drake style. Nick Drake does have some good um, steady rhythms to him though. But yeah. I mean, just learning different instruments is fun and easy now, which is the whole point of this entire ramble. Besides, just look at how pretty this is, right? Um, so if you want to do violin yoga, you can just sit here and breathe in and breathe out and go up and down on the D scale. You can make little micro adjustments to how you hold the instrument in it. Of course, everybody will have to hold it different because they have different body contours, different kinds of shoulders, neck lengths, hands, all those ratios you have to take into account. And it'll really chill you out and give you an appreciation and slow your brain down to where you refine a certain craft and technique in a way that I think is more direct than any other instrument I've ever played. Um, and I wouldn't really even call violin my favorite instrument, but it's probably one of my favorite instruments to play because it's so damned engaging to listen to I just like the combination of a person's voice and the guitar I'd say that's probably my favorite thing but anyway I digress let's move on along to the subject of death um yeah so earlier today oh my oh me what had occurred I'd gone out to buy some chicken 
and there was something I saw in a parking lot that made me think about death. Um, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Scratch that then. Here's my thought on death. Death seems <sighs> where they start. There will be some fellow or some person who will be either on a deathbed or observing somebody dying, or it will be a third person narration in a novel. Um, and it will be something to the effect of he couldn't believe how prosaic it all was. There was a certain sense of dullness as the cold water enveloped him, and the panic that had been there before slowly dissipated into an um, oblivion. Wow, that was terrible. <laughs> I'm really bad at doing this on the spot when I'm talking. I'm terribly self-conscious because I can also see my face right now because it's just the way the camera has to be angled because it's a phone camera. But yeah, um, there's not that many different ways you can describe a death scene. And it makes me think of finality. It makes me think of the sense of finality that we're all trying to avoid that things do just end rather abruptly you know and there's the whole tunnel and light idea and then there's that whole thing that a lot of writers will put forward to dispel the notion of the tunnel of light and of it just being a secession of uh consciousness and which one is correct if either is correct and how it makes you think about the time that you have and where you're at it's just fascinating to me in so many different ways because you can you can assemble all these angles and then really trivial events will have a profounder uh, meaning, you know? Um, basically, the interplay is like so. So, if you're keenly aware of mortality for XYZ reason, you will take life more seriously. Although at the same time, you'll know that you must enjoy life. You must fill it with music and you must fill it with reading. And things that are not, you know, industrial style, just bam, 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 production line, goings on, that kind of taking life seriously, very utilitarian you recognize simultaneously the need for being efficient and being, well, having fun. I guess this is what I'm driving at. So I think the grand purpose of life that I came to realize in that parking lot, for whatever reason, that what happened, the click with the thought that I had before, was that the best way to lead your life, as far as I can tell, I'm not trying to be some kind of guru here, is with Gnosischkeit, um, with, uh, with enjoyment, and, uh, yeah, in a very balanced way, where you do get things done, you are efficient, you are on top of things, you go to the gym, because you know you want to have a beer that you enjoy, and, uh, Right. This all ties back to like a whole thing that I've done over the course of my life, where at one point I'm like, yeah, it's all about the poetry. Ah, like there's this Nick Drake song. Oh, the frost in a broken tree, or something to that effect. And I was born to love magic, all its wonder to know. But you all lost that magic. A long, long time ago, blah, yeah. So, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit whiny, but it does have a certain charm. And when you're young, and you're just sitting in a meadow like a dirty hippie, and you think, 
why should I go out and strive and I can just sit here and I can look at a leaf and just see its beauty and all its texture and all its glory and I don't even need drugs or anything, although you know that can be fun. And then I, I sit here and I fiddle on my guitar and I describe this leaf and I create an artifice that kind of holds nature within this whole societal bio geochemical flow that we're all a part of and that's the essence of life and you get very very much thinking in that vein and then you realize it's no good because you want to go and do something else after a while for one for do you want a girl or a boy or whatever it is you're into and um you know some people yeah let's just not go there and um You see, even my phone thought that it was awkward. It doesn't like the sexy talk. Now, um, but then of course, there's, you want, you want a burger. You want a different kind of plane of experience. You want to feel something more concrete than being a poet in the wood, uh, as it were. And <laughs> so you start thinking about, I need to learn to build a bridge, right? I need to learn computer programming, right? And so you go and do that, and then you realize, why build a bridge if there's no people going to a symphony <laughs> over that bridge? And that right there is what I'm getting at. So this, this whole meandering is just an experiment in how I can get, how well I can remember the vague notions that I had that, I, that were so good that usually come out pretty damn well, um, at least in my opinion, which that doesn't sound very humble, but... I feel like I can capture them very well in writing, perhaps not so much like this, but at the same time, I want to develop the capacity to communicate on um, through different mediums as effectively as I can. Um, and maybe just my attempt in doing so will inspire others to do so, which means more content, and I love content. I love to go to YouTube and find all of these interesting people and artists and the art that they make. and. Uh, it is just uh, so so great. Uh, yeah, and in case anybody's wondering about why I was singing that song at the beginning, I'll be here at my station all night. It's just got a very like, hey, you can come and join me if you're into what I'm doing. And all that I'm doing is just dancing and having a good time. And I'm gonna be here and I'm dedicated because I friggin' love you. And don't be a douchebag and come on over because I'll be at my station all night, baby. All right, yeah, it's a good vibe. It's a good, good vibe. <sighs> so, I'm rereading Michael Crichton's State of Fear. There was a very gory death scene in here. Um, and I thought, my gosh, my gosh, but it is a harsh reality of the world, isn't it? Gory deaths do occur at a rather alarming pace and more than we would like to think. In point of fact, uh, he, Michael Crichton, through this work of fiction, pointed out a lot of flaws in environmentalist thinking, which as an environmentalist, I feel like it's my responsibility to take too hard. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole global warming thing here and now, perhaps never, because I just don't want to open the can of worms because it's too emotionally tinged and I have other things that require my rapt attention. I'm working on the water issue for a book. But the, the points about psychology that are made are uh, pretty damn salient. The things that we do to conserve the energy and the industries we build around that can take our attention and focus away from problems of the poor, both at home and abroad. Um, and I think, it, I think it's just something that happens because we can only focus on one thing at a time. I don't even think the people are necessarily malicious or ignorant. It's just that trying to solve the problem, whether or not, you know, it's something that can be solved that's environmental, 
and you lose sight that every step you take, as the biologist E.O. Wilson pointed out in Consilience, is a prosthetic step. It's the building and the adding of um, a novelty to nature that is requires a lot of energy, resources, and time. And when you do that, <laughs> generally, your population starts to increase. And as you continue doing that, you require more and more novel prosthetic infrastructure to support the uh, beast, as it were. Now, we should do away with the whole notion of people are bad. We should do away with that notion because it's disgusting. Um, people are a part of nature. We just have to learn to live with it and with each other in a way that is sustainable. And we have to let go of certain, like Michael Crichton was talking about, the balance of nature um, ideas. Because nature was never really balanced. And every time you're trying to balance nature, that again is in itself, while it's not like a dam, it is a prosthesis. It's your idea of how nature should be flowing. Obviously, there are criticisms towards that of like, well, the dodo went extinct because people ate or hunted too much of them. And, well, that certain bare bones, things like that, need to be taken into account. But we sh I think there's a certain degree of, of arrogance that comes from um, blindness that we can control and understand really complicated, really multifaceted processes that, um, honestly, in the case that Michael Crichton laid out in the Yellowstone Park incident, which is actually, he, he took a bunch of factual accounts and then what he does in a lot of his novels is he frames scientific and philosophical concepts in the form of dialogue. And so there's like little mini lectures in which is why I really love um, his work. So what he did was uh, talked about the Yellowstone where they tried to manage the wolf population and then the elk and the caribou population exploded. And it was just a whole mess that you can go and, and read about because I don't want to just blabber incoherently about it for too long here. But yeah, um, we really have to take a step back and everyone has to come and work together. What uh, E.O. Wilson in his book Consilience said to that effect was that the exceptionalists, which is the people that think we can just erect new structures and technology will get us out of everything and there is no limit, need to get together with the environmentalist types and instead of fighting each other, they need to work together. There needs to be a certain cooperation. And I really wish that I could give you a more fleshed out and detailed account of how best to do that. But there's just so much information and figuring out a way to present it right now, I can't. But that's one of the things that I will be trying to do. One of the points of this podcast is to introduce the ideas in my line of thinking and see if it's something that you value or think you can extract value out of, or if you disagree with me in the direction that I'm going, um, feel free to share your criticisms, thoughts, and concerns, and I'll try to take them into account. Um, obviously, if you're uh, like ridiculously rude or something, I might not respond to you, but generally, um, if I have the time, I, I work and I have responsibilities, I will try to get back to everybody who makes a cogent and legitimate uh, point because that's I think that all of science all of philosophy is just a grand conversation and I'd like to be a part of it with all of the interesting people that are currently on this planet I think there's like seven or so billion of us you know food for thought how are we all going to cooperate I have trouble cooperating with uh, people who I love dearly <laughs> sometimes and, um, yeah, it can get chaotic. <sighs> One thing, too. Now, I don't want to disparage any particular company, especially since I don't know. But, again, 
this could just be some kind of paranoia. That's absolutely incorrect. But beer companies, especially, you know, bigger, more generic beer brands that we're all familiar with uh, here in the States, obviously, like Budweiser, etc., put additives and things in their beer to make it, I think, cheaper to produce and to last longer. <laughs> and the kind of props and things that they use... Not exactly good for your health, now obviously, you're drinking, you're already doing something bad for your health, but should it be so bad as certain literature that I've read points it out to be? Here are all these um, cancers and things sprouting up, and a lot of it has to do with pollutants, um, I believe, from industry and from the way that we're doing agriculture like the uh, nitrification of the uh, waterways in the Chesapeake Bay that I've talked about in previous videos on this channel, etc. But also everything is driven by this need to produce a vast volume in order to turn a profit. I, I perfectly understand, and I'm a capitalist, so bear that in mind, that I'm not against the idea of turning profit but E.O. Wilson talks about something called full cost accounting which is how long are you going to be able to make a profit if you destroy the human beings that consume your product and the land on which those human beings and your business exists now obviously I don't think anybody like necessarily does this with full conscious intent but it does occur for instance Newtown Creek up in New York was giving people, apparently, allegedly, as per Alex Bardome's book, at least people thought, and there was a very good case for it, all kinds of exotic bone cancers. And when you make things like beer and stuff, it's very water intensive. I'm a fan of beer, and I don't think the beer industry should go anywhere. I like them being around. But we do have to consider, when we're producing things in volume, what is it absolutely necessary to uh, produce? And if you're a business person and you want to open up a business, try to do so responsibly, you know? I know that there's a lot of green stuff and everybody has ethics boards and it's all very trendy, but there's kind of a veneer feeling to that where I don't know if they're necessarily doing it just for the sake of appearance, but I feel like Feeling like you've taken a step to address an issue is a different thing from actually addressing the issue. You know, it, it is what it is, my little um, meandering on that topic there. But, now we talked about death and resources and all this heavy stuff let's talk about how everything is actually good how we've got access to these fine instruments that we can just purchase through a system of barter where we make monthly installment payments something that yeah if you're on a budget it can cut in but it's still doable you might just be a little bit uncomfortable um yeah i mean thirty dollars a month how bad is that? Really, for something this beautiful that gives you so many hours of pleasure and that refines your mind and allows you to play and jam with people just because of the novelty of the violin. Uh, I think that, you know, we, we're all, we all are raised in this like idea of, oh man, yeah, the arts, the music is good. Basically, American now is the product of the baby boomer generation of everybody being this free spirit, right? Because those are the people that raised Gen X and then Gen X raised us. And now that we're of age, we're going to be raising whatever the hell this new generation is going to be called. Uh, I think it speaks, it speaks volumes that we uh, are terming these generations things like X and Y. It's like, do we, it, because it's the new millennium, do we think that everything is coming to an end? Is that what it is? I mean, there was the whole Mayan prophecy and thing, but there is a certain 
hilarious kind of hubris and to me the whole intergenerational warfare that's going on people calling each other snowflakes and millennials while, while it's fun to engage in just for the sake of wow this is what what, what the hell are we doing <laughs> it's indicative of, of a friggin problem and i'm not going to go into that here because we're focusing on good stuff and i'm trying to keep it keep a positive groovy crunchy vibe here dude but um yeah so even though we were raised in that kind of environment of yeah express yourself have fun with your instruments it's become kind of like oppressive to wear oh well you're a poser or something to that effect i uh I went into this music shop, right? And I bought really basic books on, you know, classics, classical music and music theory and things. And this this kid, at this point I was about 24 and he looked to be about like 20. Uh, at this point I was like 26 or 27. And he, he looked to be about, you know, in his early, early 20s, 21, 20, something like that. And he just shot me the most condescending look. Like, what are you doing buying this book? You think you're going to learn music? I'm like... Yeah, I like life. I like music. I I should have spent more time probably learning it earlier because I would be better at it at this point, but this whole idea of like improving yourself being a bad thing and thinking that you can do it on your own also like um I'll go to various gatherings like like I'd like a church or something and there'll be people there and you know, they'll ask what you're doing, and you describe, I'm writing a book, I'm doing this, and immediately you'll get this kind of like, back. oh, well, you just think you're this friggin' guy. I'm like, yeah, but your daughter's enrolling in college, right? So, she's gonna go into medicine, right? Yeah, okay. So, has she ever shown any extraordinary capacity for science? Is there something that she's done that suggested to you that uh, she's supposed to take out this huge college loan because right now at about 18 or 19 years old she thinks she wants to go into medicine you think you think me writing a book on a topic i'm passionate about and have read a lot about and writing itself being something that i've done for years and years and years now you think that's a goofy idea and you think it's pretentious that I consider myself someone somewhat of an artistic type, but you don't think it's pretentious for somebody to basically put the family in crisis for the whim, for the notion that they are going to, first of all, have the capacity to complete a very complicated course of study, and then to actually enjoy it once they realize what it is. I already know what I'm doing, and I know the things about it that suck and that don't. But you're promoting a culture where if I'm not doing the things that I'm doing in the context of some institution, I'm somehow a weirdo. And then when within the weirdo circles, there's also a really annoying, like I said, despite the whole, yeah, do your own thing, there's a really annoying cliquish elitism of you're a poser for XYZ reason. And I, it's just, it's terrible. But it's great at the same time. Because more of us are doing it. And even though these are legitimate problems I'm talking about, people are coming around um, to, to, to expressing themselves uh, more, to cultivating the arts and those sentiments more, again, than... We didn't in the past, for one, we didn't really have as much time for it, and for two, we have more access to information, so we're able to take those notions and ideas that would have required like a library or some very skilled person to transmit and learn them on our own in ways that are more advanced more quickly. But at the same time, that the very ease of this is just... It can create a lack of feedback, um, which is why I think it's important to play instruments and to talk and engage with people and to go out and balance yourself off of ideas and concepts and compare and contrast with other musicians and artists and the like. Not only is it like terribly fun because engagement of 
those neurons and the pers interpersonal stuff is just, just pleasant in its own right. But it's, uh, it's the best way for actually knowing that you learned something well. Because if you Google something or if you search something and you think you're an expert in a subject, likewise, if you just go to a university, because you'll, you'll, you'll be in a particular environment, you, you just don't, don't really know. You don't have that biomechanical feedback of, hey, this is, this is what this is, and I can execute it at will. And I can also see, as I'm executing it, things that are wrong about it, and I have an innate sense of what it is, rather than the regurgitation of, hey, I'm going to look up how to tie whatever, some kind of sailor's knot on YouTube, and now I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go out on my, on my, uh, my catamaran or whatever the hell people would do. I don't know. I had a couple of rich friends like that. And... <sighs> Yeah, you're just going to be lost at sea when you do that because you might think you know things, but until you've actually gone out on that ocean, which to this hypothetical person's credit, they did. Yeah, the, the reason I even mentioned this is there's so many people that have that like Google know it all thing, or you're a guy that's an amateur and you recognize that you're an amateur, but you're having a good time. You're just fiddling around, literally, and you're there to try to express that creative urge, that idea, and then they'll come at you like, man, you, you, your friggin' scales suck, or your timing sucks, or that arpeggio was crap, or whatever, and it's like, right, okay, I understand that, now work with me, because you're an amateur too, but if you feel... That you know more than I do, let's work this problem out, that way we can continue having a good time, instead of you just thinking you're some amazing badass because you might have spent a few more minutes practicing or looking something up on Google, which, you know, yeah, the practice thing would be a legitimate thing, oh, well, you need to go back and practice, fine, but generally, it's more of like someone uses, like, something that we all have our strengths, so there'll be a person that has a strength. My strength is telling a story, writing a lyric, um, doing like a really simple chord progression with a that helps convey that feeling. The, a lot of my friends are more technically inclined in terms of musicianship, and their strength would be like playing some kind of nice little scale rhythm that makes a lot of sense, but honestly, in my opinion, it's kind of boring because it's just like it's just this pretty little. Uh, and I recognize that in its own right, that's great. But for some reason, they can't recognize, or at least if they do, they don't, they don't value it as much. And I'm like, right, but I don't value your thing as much, but I'm going out of my way to try to make this work since we're both here with instruments and we're trying to have fun. And that kind of vibe, the whole reason I'm describing this little microcosmic crapule is that that's taken into into everything and despite everything being great it's at the same time just ridiculously like unnecessarily complicated it's like dude we could do so much more awesome stuff have so much more great art if we all just calm the hell down and try to work together i understand that hey you want to stick it to somebody if that person thinks i'm crap that's their right to say so because that also helps me out but at the same time, you shouldn't become addicted to just calling everyone an asshole. <laughs> I don't. I don't know, man. Am I making sense here? What 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 mark am I at? I'm at 37 minutes. This is a good podcast length, and I think I'm gonna sign off here because I was gonna go for more of a uh, fun, lighthearted vibe, but this turned into what it is. And I hope uh, you enjoyed. Hopefully, you just put this on in the background because there's no reason for anything else. But. Uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, subscribe, click the like button, check out my website. And consider donating to my Patreon. I don't particularly feel very comfortable asking for that quite yet because I, I, I want to reach a certain consistency and volume of creative material I put out there, as well as quality of the creative material. But, you know, um, having better equipment would help. And I can't really spend money on equipment if I'm spending money on 
the things I need to spend money on, which is, you know, gas and food and electricity and the like. Um, so, hey, I'm going to play a silly little uh, way call to action as it's um, referred to in marketing at the end of this video where I just on a whim yesterday when I recognized that there was something awry with my stove, I'm like, this is why you need to support your hipster musician, podcaster, writer types because our stoves are broken. And if you never support me for whatever reason, you don't think that I do a good enough job, that's totally fine. Uh, just be sure that you find somebody, if you have the resources, like two or three bucks to, to anybody else that you would want to give to or to me. Hey, gosh, <laughs> but do it. No, but um, you know what I'm talking about, right? Just find find somebody that you enjoy that does something for free and help them out if you can. Um, I'll just always be making things like a lot of these uh, creators are, but I feel like it's necessary to point out that if you want to have a vibrant arts community that's dedicated to uh, actual craftsmanship, it, it, uh, they need to eat and they have stoves that need to be fixed. So I really don't like doing that, but I felt like I had to and I probably won't ever do that again except like a little two second bit at the end of asking for donations every once in a blue moon. Um, cheers. And maybe I'll just start selling mugs. <laughs> Goodbye. All right, folks. You see, this right here is putting around truck because that stove is on, but it's not showing it to be on. And I have no way of knowing to turn it off. That could cause a fire. And this is not only my grunge grid, but reasons why, if you enjoy the artwork that artists like myself provide, or whatever it is that I do <laughs> online, whatever it means to you, donate to our Patreons. And if it's not mine, if in fact you cringe at the idea that someone would say, hey, you know that value I offer? Maybe pitch in a couple of bucks, or maybe I'll set up some kind of shop and you can buy my stupid coffee mugs. Yeah, well, you know, we kind of kind of have things that need to be paid for as well. And two, three dollars a month, or even less, at some point. Anyway, uh, is that so much to ask for? Hmm. 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 All right. You know what? What I'm going to probably sell is a dartboard with my face so that as you watch this video and that cringy feeling comes up of, look at this, look at this man just asking for my money. Just throw darts at this face right here. Just throw darts all up in it. Usually the mac and cheese around my lips is a comfort food. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it's going to be it.